I'm James Bennett from The Atlantic, um, and our next conversation is going to be about housing and neighborhood development. Um, during Katrina, I think about 70% of all homes were damaged and more than 400,000 people were displaced and families that had been living in some neighborhoods for generations um, saw their homes and their whole neighborhoods become uninhabitable overnight. Uh, now, 10 years later, we've seen the largest housing recovery program in the history of the nation, I think, take place here. Um, and the population is back to about 80% of what it was before the storm. So how's the housing mix changed? How's the character of the neighborhoods changed? Where might further development take New Orleans in the future? Um, uh, we have a really great group here to discuss this, beginning at the, uh, on the other couch at the far end. This is uh, Press Kabakoff, who's co-chairman of the board of directors and CEO of HRI Properties, which is a national um, developer headquartered here in New Orleans. Um, among other roles, he chaired the New Orleans Housing, co-chaired, excuse me, the New Orleans uh, Housing Task Force Committee during the mayor's transition. To his right is Sarah Rose Wartel, uh, the president of the Urban Institute, which is our partner in, in putting on this event, and thank you, Sarah, very much. Uh, she was previously a deputy assistant to the president for economic policy and deputy director of the National Economic Council. Before that, she held a role at the Department of Housing wow. and Urban Development. Um, and to my immediate left is the other co-chairman of the mayor's um, task force on, on housing during the transition, transition James Perry, uh, who's also the former executive director of the Greater New Orleans Fair Housing Action Center, a role in which he won, I believe, several large settlements um, on behalf of people whose homes were damaged in the storm. And, and Press, I thought we might just start with you and, um, and, and sort of at the big picture level, um, the mayor has called, and, and we heard um, some of this again today, New Orleans, the, leading, the, the leading, social, leading laboratory for social change. Um, I recognize that that language is not universally popular, but it is an interesting way to express the idea of what's happened here. And, what is your view of, of how that has played out in housing, and has the experiment been a success? Well, let me just start off with a, with a vignette. Uh, uh, we're a rather large firm and headquartered here, and 60% of our employees lost their home in Katrina. And so we decamped to a city called Homa, where we had some apartment houses, and we moved our offices there. And I think the third or fourth day, after the storm, uh, my president and I uh, outlined a budget for, uh, for Louisiana. We, we couldn't get anybody on the phone. We called, uh, ended up getting on the phone with Andy Coplin, now the mayor's chief administrative officer. Then he worked with, with uh, Blanco, the, uh, uh, the governor, and we outlined a proposal for help to the city. Uh, including uh, housing, and, and we concluded that the federal government was likely, we needed it, uh, to send down a great big bundle of money for, uh, for housing. It was later called the Road Home Program, and uh, we were concerned that they would end up reconcentrating poverty, and so we uh, uh, suggested that we change all the rules to allow uh, for funding for mixed income housing. And we ended up actually getting uh, uh, 11 or $12 billion, and they carved out a, a, a $600 million mixed income housing program, which they call the piggyback program. And our firm, uh, which focused right after Katrina on New Orleans, uh, ended up building about 1,000 homes uh, in that program. So I'll leave it there, and we can continue the discussion. Did you ever doubt that the housing stock would be rebuilt here, as some people suggested? Well, I was a bit of a talking head, and I remember uh, jostling with uh, uh, the fellow named Stevens from Alaska who suggested New Orleans not get any money. And one of the serious questions uh, was whether the federal government would grace us with the funds that we need we ended up getting about $142 billion, uh, uh, 50 or 60% from the feds, uh, BP oil spills, uh, uh, 
uh, insurance, uh, philanthropic. And during the early days, we just didn't know what was coming. And if it did not come, we would not be having this conference right now. So James, if I could come to you, how, how do you think the, the character of the city and its neighborhoods um, is different today than it was before the storm as a consequence of the redevelopment that's taken place? Well, it's, um, it's, it's dramatically different. Uh, I think the, um, and, and I, I back up a second and I'd say that the, um, and, and I'm, you know, obviously we, we chatted about this a bit um, backstage, you know, the, uh, the language that the mayor uses, um, uh, referring to the city as a as a laboratory, I think is is language that, that a lot of people do reject. You know, I, I, I'm not I'm not sure that people uh, um, uniformly agree with this idea that the city uh, is a laboratory. Um, you know, pe people certainly um, when their lives are are in, in danger and at stake, and when they're um, struggling to recover, uh, I think you know, struggle with that language. Uh, that said, uh, uh, I think the numbers in some cases tell the tale of how different the city is. Certainly, uh, home ownership was much more affordable before the storm. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to afford uh, the purchase of a home uh, at this stage. Uh, certainly, uh, rental was much more affordable before the storm. Uh, I think it's, it's also true that um, a number of neighborhoods were more integrated uh, before the storm. Uh, it's, it's also true that um, because of the uh, dramatic change in public housing, it simply was a, a very different uh, city. Uh, if, if you presume that 100,000 African American residents have been displaced, uh, you have to presume that, uh, that those residents uh, had a, a very important role in the culture and the makeup of who and what the city is. And, and so, um, is the city better, better or worse? I, I think that's a, a different question, but is it the same? Certainly not. It's, it's, it's a different city, um, and, and I, I think that, um, um, that, that we are all interested and, I think, excited to see what the future of the city will be, but it's certainly different. But Sarah, I mean, I, I, the experience of this city is completely exceptional in so many ways, but how different are the patterns of habitation that we're seeing here from what we're seeing nationally in other cities across the country? So uh, let me just say one thing that I, I'm not an expert in New Orleans, and I'm here with the folks who are. Um, uh, we, at the national level, look at data and trends, and here locally we rely very much, and a big shout out to Allison Plyer and the really amazing team at the Data Center, part of our, we have a network of open data neighborhood partnerships and national neighborhood partnership, and they are rock stars in that group. Um, so we rely a lot on that. But, um, if you look at the larger picture, you always have to remember when you look at data that when you talk about housing and communities, um, you're talking about the places where people live. And neighborhood and place, a lot of the social science research tells us these days, is, uh, ha has confirmed what we've always sort of instinctively know, places where people have built the social fabric of their lives, their neighborhoods that was so deeply um, disrupted by Katrina, places also where people access um, opportunity, and we have a opportunity here to uh, build a city which does a better job of creating access to the, the infrastructure that helps people uh, strengthen their lives and improve them. Um, that said, as you suggested, um, disasters tend to accelerate things that are already happening to places, and in this case, New Orleans was already suffering from a population decline. It was already suffering from serious challenges of affordability for housing, and it was already suffering from income disparities, and all of those grew worse through the crisis. And when you look at the trajectory that New Orleans is on now and the big challenges it faces looking forward, those are challenges that also are national across many of the other cities, both growing and declining cities, weaker cities that we see across the country. Again, rising um, rental housing costs, uh, growing income disparities, a real gulf between what it costs to support, whether rental or home ownership, and unfortunately the stagnant wages that where jobs are being created, those jobs are not in the kind of places where they'll support a real cost of housing. So, press, uh, uh, let me just, uh, uh, New Orleans is a city of neighborhoods, 
most cities are, but we really have some very interesting neighborhoods. Everybody in the world knows that. And uh, after the storm, uh, the money that I talked to did not come in initially. There was a great number of year lag before money could, which might have been a good thing because it's possible it could have been wasted. And so neighborhood groups frustrated by not getting the funds they needed to rebuild their neighborhood banded together and started to plan. We planned and planned and planned and planned. And then national and international city planners said, New Orleans is where I want to be. And so they came in. So we had a top-down and bottoms-up planning strategy. And when the money started to flow, these neighborhoods started to prove. I'm one of those that believe that New Orleans is a far better city than it was before Katrina and moving in the right direction, and we're not, not there. But you have to look at housing in the context of overall, as you say, senses of place, neighborhood approving. Tale of two cities. I think the head of the Hano said the other day that we have some 18,000 people waiting for vouchers or public housing, and if you opened up the roll today, you might have another 50,000. And so those... The roll has been closed since 2012. Since 2012. And, 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 oh, 2012. So those are staggering numbers of people that are in need, paying too much percentage of their income. And so to that extent, uh, we have an issue that is perhaps more serious in many cities in the country, but only also indicative of what's happening all over the nation. One out of every, uh, just um, before the crisis, there was a affordable, available unit for very low income people for only one out of every three people who were uh, in need in the city. Uh, today, that number is one out of, there's only one unit for every four people. And if the uh, uh, federal housing assistance was not available, that number would be zero. There would be none. So um, to ask a stupid question, another one, James, maybe um, this sounds like an opportunity for a developer, right? There's a tremendous demand. Rents are very high in the city relative to income. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of pent-up demand for housing stock. So why isn't the right stock getting created? Well, well, let me just pause for a second and say that, you know, Press is, is absolutely right. You know, it, it really is a, a tale of two cities. And um, th th there really are some neighborhoods that are just doing remarkably well. And, and there are some, uh, some neighborhoods that, that couldn't be doing uh, better. But it, it's, it just is also true that neighborhoods like the North Ninth, Ninth Ward couldn't be uh, doing worse. You know? So um, to, to this question of, of, uh, of, of looking at uh, a community with so much demand and wondering uh, you know, you know, if, if, if there's so much opportunity for a developer, then you know, where, where's the housing? I think the, the challenge is that, that we've gotten to a point uh, that there's a huge amount of need, but, but I think, as has already been mentioned, um, wages are stagnant. You know, our wages in the community simply are not rising. And, and so, uh, so th there's need, uh, in, and certainly there is need for more housing, but, there, but, uh, but there's not enough capital, capital to, uh, to meet the demand. And so I, I think that the only way that you, um, that, that you um, can cause more housing to be built is really through government subsidy. And the greatest challenge uh, is that in this political environment, I think it's extremely unlikely that there's going to be dramatic government subsidy to build enough housing uh, in, in New Orleans, but probably anywhere in the nation to meet the affordable housing need. Well, the, the two cities that we talked about, and I really want to emphasize, I think New Orleans is on the right tra trajectory. And, and what we do in the next 10 years will large tell whether we reach a sort of self-sustaining, healthy climate. I think we're heading that way. It'll take a lot of work. From a developer perspective, we do both affordable and market rate housing. What we're see seeing here is because New Orleans is a series of interesting neighborhoods, it's attracting people from all over the country to come live here. And it's also bringing in people from the region. So in Orleans Parish, which is some um, 400,000 people of the million three that we have in the metropolitan area, you're seeing a great demand for housing. From, so if you're a developer, it's a very good economy, and you're seeing a lot of product being developed on all these neighborhoods that you can see right 
right from this hotel. On the flip side, if the numbers are anywhere near what the head of the Hano says, uh, you have 60, 70,000 people in need of an affordable place. Uh, you, you're talking about, uh, uh, let's say, you need a gap check of 70,000. You do the math, multiply that out, that's a $5 billion shortfall. And I think James is absolutely right that uh, this city, which doesn't have any large gas in financing, the state, which has got a tremendous deficit, the federal dollars have been spent. We really have a challenge. I think we need to take our case to Washington. Maybe you'll tell us how to do that. <laughs> Well, I think there are a couple things going on. First of all, um, across the country, there is this challenge of the gap between what a moderate income family or a low income family can afford to pay in rent and what it costs to produce a new unit. So your question was, why isn't the market responding to the demand? And it's because even though there is need, there isn't enough income. You can only produce so many apartment complexes with concierges for, th th there's not enough demand there. The kind of work that Prez is doing, try to at least move down that income spectrum is great, but to get to the needs of, of very low income people and moderate income people, you need to have more subsidy. Bending the cost curve, we talk about that in the healthcare class, how do we lower the trajectory of increasing costs of producing healthcare? Bending the cost curve on housing is, I think, a huge conversation that we're gonna have to have. How do we make it less expensive to produce more units so that we can make the, the close the gap between incomes? We also have to work on the income side. And while it's an enormous credit that a city that lost 100,000 people, uh, or more than that, and which went through what the city did is creating jobs, creating a lot of jobs. Those jobs tend to still be in the service sector uh, and in tourism and not in the places that produce the higher income. So on the employ creating more income as well as lowering the cost of housing units has to be part of the conversation. I'd like to go quickly to the audience, please, for questions. I think there's one, there we go. Harrison, I'm a small, um rental property owner, and I wanted to say that everyone always concentrates on the affordable housing, but neglects to mention how the Road Home Small Rental Property Program has basically become cost prohibitive with the cost of insurance, flood, and homeowners, taxes, and utilities eating up the meager profits that rentals may produce. It's basically state forced charity that I'm providing. What can be done to help people in this situation? Sure, heard the question. So, she, go ahead. Yeah, she, she asked about the small uh, rental property program that was set up by um, that was the small rental program that that was set up by the road home program, and uh, you know, uh, and, and, and the core of the question was what can be done to help landlords who participated in the program, and um, you know I, I, I just start by saying that that I agree that that program, I think it was inherent in your question, I, I, and I agree that the program was just a disaster. It was a, um, it was a, a terrible setup, and it, it didn't help very many people, and I think that it wasn't helpful, uh, unfortunately, to renters, and it wasn't helpful to landlords who sought to help renters. And, um, and you know, I, I'm somewhat removed from the program at this point, and so I'm not sure about how or whether or not landlords can get out of the program. What I, what I would recommend that you do is contact um, my former office, the Fair Housing Center. Their phone number is 596-2100, 596-2100. Um, and, uh, and, and they do have a, a program that has worked extensively, extensively to try to get that program to work well. Unfortunately, no one was successful in getting it to work well, but hopefully they could help you to find a, a way to get out of, uh, out of your predicament. James, if I could, sure. there are two key insights in that question. The first is that uh, most of the folks who rent don't rent from complex owners. They rent from small owners, either someone who owns an individual home or owns a multi-unit property of some kind. And figuring out how to provide capital to that, keep that stock going is a huge problem nationwide, but especially in New Orleans that has a lower home ownership rate than many other countries. The other thing is that the homeowners that we do have in New Orleans um, uh, has, homeownership has been available at a lot of income uh, levels, a lot of owner-occupied homes, even for very uh, moderate uh, income families. And the uh, very, very tight access to credit that we've had since the um, uh, 
mortgage bust has meant that um, homeowners in neighborhoods that went through stress have horrible trouble refinancing their homes. We're starting to see a tiny bit of loosening, but nowhere near are we back to the healthy mortgage market. And that would bring capital back into New Orleans neighborhoods as well. And I'd also just back up for a second and say, you know, the, the idea behind the small landlord program was that for all the, um, the, the people who own single and double uh, properties in New Orleans, you know, historic shotguns, uh, who rent, you know, one half of their, their, their property, they'd be uh, an opportunity for them to uh, get, at least get some of the recovery money and be able to, to rebuild their homes at the same time. And, you know, it's, it's something that Councilperson Stacey Head has really, really pushed on this entire time. You know, she, she was forceful about this idea that all the recovery money for rental properties all, all went to big developers and said, hey, we have to find a way to make it work for small mom and pop landlords. And, and so it was so frustrating to see this program fail so dramatically and see it work so poorly for small landlords. And so, uh, so you know, I, I share your frustration. And um, actually, uh, to add to the frustration, I'm afraid that's where we have to leave things. This is a conversation we'll be picking up in various ways over the course of the day, though. It's obviously such a core issue um, and presents so many interesting um, compelling questions about what this city is, is going to look like in 10 years. So thank you all thank very you. much.